Uh, hello, thank you everyone to attend my presentation. Uh, my name is Flavio Solin. I work for Intel and I have been contributing with Zephyr for the last six years. I'm the current maintainer uh, of the power management subsystem and I'm also involved in other areas of the project. Uh, the presentation today is about power management and my goal here is to provide uh, a good overview of the features and the architectural framework that underpins uh, Zephyr's power management capabilities. Additionally, uh, I will also provide some you know, uh, guidelines to use and implement power management. So why uh, we care about power management, right? These are just a few reasons. Uh, first, uh, to extend battery life, uh, provide longer battery life for devices is very crucial for you know, battery powered IoT and wearable devices. Uh, another good reason to care about power management is cost savings. Uh, lower energy consumption translates directly you know, to cost savings, and it makes products uh, more competitive in the market. Uh, another reason is environmental impact, uh, since you know, reducing power consumption contributes to lower carbon emissions. Uh, regular compliance is another you know, reason. Many regions uh, have uh, regulations to energy consumption for electronic devices, so we need to, to be aware of this. And even in user experience, uh, you know, uh, less frequent charging, it's related with more user satisfaction. Uh, definitely there are other reasons here, just you know, a, a few. Uh, so these are the topics that I will cover today. Uh, I will start with uh, design and goals, uh, and then I will cover power management implementation on Zephyr and finish uh, with how to enable and use it. Hopefully, uh, you know, we will have some uh, room for questions as well in the, in the end of the presentation. Okay, uh, so design and objectives. First and more obvious, we want to reduce power consumption, right? We want to provide a way to consume as little energy as possible while we are still you know, meeting functional requirements for a given use case and configuration. Secondly, we must be, uh, we, uh, this must be flexible. Uh, different use cases and configurations have different power you know, uh, and functional requirements. Then uh, it's mandatory to maintain responsiveness uh, uh, for the system. The system must be able to, uh, to properly respond to events. Uh, like, uh, like be flexible, it must scale. It must scale from you know, simple constraint devices to much more complex systems. And we went to do, the, we went to do this as much abstract as possible, providing a consistent interface for applications uh, as you know, many other areas on the project. So what the subsystem does is provide mechanisms for you know, a collaborative uh, model where different parts of Zephyr like device drivers, uh, subsystems, and applications can work together you know, to, to, to meet these uh, objectives. So here are some uh, key concepts that will help to navigate through Zephyr's power management. Uh, the first concept is kernel idling. Uh, kernel idling, as we are going to see uh, later, it's the code that is executed every time the system has nothing to do because you know all the threads are blocked waiting some condition. Uh, it's basically here where the system power management happens. Uh, then we will go to the power management subsystem, see that the power management subsystem is divided in two major areas, a system power management and device power management. System power management is done in the idle thread, as I mentioned, and it's responsible to save energy changing the SOC power state. Uh, so Power state can also be called idle state or sleep state, depending on the nomenclature, uh, depending on the document that you see. On Zephyr, we mostly use power states for this. Uh, an important component of the system power management is the policy manager that we will see. Uh, the policy is responsible to make uh, the decision about which power state should be used when the system gets idle. And, and based on the events and the, you know, possible conditions that were imposed for, for, to this policy. Uh, like power constraints and latest constraints can be you know, set to the policy that will change the decision that the policy can make. Uh, we are going to see later uh, how you know, 
the default policy works and how an application can change the, the behavior of this policy. The other major area that uh, we'll see is device power management, that it's responsible to save uh, energy suspend devices. Uh, device power management can also be you know, uh, uh, static or dynamic. Uh, the static is when the devices are suspended together with the system. So when the system goes idle, we suspend the, the devices and when it wakes up, we just resume then. And dynamic, on the other hand, uh, it's more ad hoc. Devices can automatically, you know, suspend and uh, resume themselves. Um, one example, uh, an example of uh, device runtime is a UART. You know, UART can get a reference from a GP I/O driver when you know it's needed and release this when it's not needed anymore. Uh, if no one else is using this GP I/O, the GP I/O would be suspended. Um, this dynamic device power management on Zephyr we call device runtime power management. So let's just start with the system power management. So to understand the, the system power management, we have first to talk about uh, a little bit about the scheduler and the idle thread. The scheduler is the, is the main power management governed since it knows when you know, the next event will happen and consequently can, you know, it knows when to start doing power management. Uh, the Zephyr scheduler is a priority based scheduler with a, a optional round robin time slicing. And this means that the scheduler you know, will run first uh, high priority threads. So, as you can see in this diagram, the scheduler will execute thread one. Then, you know, when thread one reaches a reschedule point that can be, for instance, caused by waiting on a semaphore, or yielding, or you know, sleeping. This thread is marked as suspended or waiting. Then uh, it will do the same for thread two, thread t, uh, three, so on and so forth. Uh, finally, when all these threads are suspended or waiting in some condition, the scheduler will go and schedule a special thread that it's the idle thread. Uh, there is one idle thread per CPU and it's created with the lowest priority, uh, priori uh, priori so this ensures that the idle thread is executed only when there is nothing else to do. Uh, one important thing to mention here is that you know, Zephyr kernels is strictly, is strictly capable, where, which means that the kernel you know, is fully uh, event driven, so there is no periodic clock interrupting uh, the system. So here we have a, a high-level diagram of the idle thread. Uh, it's basically you know, a, a continuous loop that every iteration locks uh, IR queues to avoid being preempted during the, the power management sequence. Then if the target does not support power management, the idle thread just restore interruptions and put the CPU to, uh, idle, way, uh, idle waiting for you know, uh, some event to happen. Now, when the system supports power management, then the idle thread will you know, call the PM subsystem with the number, uh, with the amount of the time to the next event that it's scheduled. The subsystem then may or may not you know, suspend the CPU based on possible constraints or if the time is enough to, you know, to, to use one of these sleep states. If the CPU is not suspended, then it's exactly uh, as if power management was disabled, then the idle thread would just, you know, behave uh, like uh, without power management, just uh, unlocking the IRQ, IRQs and uh, waiting for an event. And that it's all for the idle thread, basically. Uh, the key or trick part here is that, you know, at the end of the loop, uh, interruptions should be, uh, has to be, you know, uh, unlocked. So it's a little bit tricky because you start with the interruptions locked and then you, have power, you do power management and at the end of this you have to remember to restore interruptions. So from that perspective, uh, perspective system power management happens inside the, you know, this function called PM uh, system suspend, the highlighted box here. So uh, this diagram on the left uh, abstracts what the system power management basically does. Uh, in a nutshell, we, you know, it checks with the policy manager which power state should be used based on the amount of the time to the next uh, event. If the policy returns a state that it's uh, different from active or runtime idle, uh, the devices are suspended. Uh, 
I will talk about this later, but the, obviously this depends on device power management to be enabled. And after this, the subsystem will call SOC API asking to transition to this state that the policy return. When the CPU wakes up, the subsystem will you know, revert what was done, so we'll resume all the devices and finally you know, call this another SOC API that it's uh, uh, basically restore to, to, to give the system full operational again. And it's expected, you know, the, when you return from this function that the IRQs are unlocked. So power state. Uh, power states for Zephyr, it's a way to describe, you know, the multiple uh, power mode savings uh, supported by the hardware. And they were, very, you know, inspired by the ACPI system states. Uh, these states, uh, they have to be, you know, declared in, in the device tree so they can be accessible by other components in the system, like the policy manager, uh, that we use this information to, you know, to, to select which state the CPU should be suspended. So we have seven states, counting the active state on Zephyr. Um, the states go from active, where the system is fully, you know, uh, powered, to soft off, where that it's the deepest uh, sleep state available, and that it's the one that consumes the minimal amount of power. Of course, as GPU is the state in this list, more uh, is the energy that it's saved, but also it, it's bigger the time to transitioning and to leave from these states and to wake up the system. So platforms should, you know map their states to these ones. And in most cases, obviously, they don't have all these states, and that it's fine. Uh, they need to declare only the states that are supported by the, the, the hardware. Uh, there may be certain cases where, you know, a target has two sleep states that would map to a particular Zephyr state, and in, for these circumstances, they can use a substate that would be, you know, specific for this target. One important note here is uh, Zephyr does not really impose which states the target uh, has to implement, and, and we don't even, you know, uh, uh, impose what has to be done in this state. So we just provide, you know, a general guideline and some expectations, but not really impose any behavior for these states. Uh, the policy will select which stage, uh, state that, uh, that it's passed directly, to, uh, basically, the state that it's returning from the policy would be passed direct, directly to the SOC. And the SOC, it's up to the SOC to do whatever it, uh, it wants with this state. So on, on the left, uh, on the left I have a full representation of the power state in the device tree, right? Besides the state itself, we have uh, other two properties uh, that are a minimal residence and that tells the minimal time uh, that the system uh, should stay idle to, you know, to be worthwhile in energy wise in speaking. And the as a exit latency, that it's the amount of time required to the system exit this state and become active. Uh, this is, these informations are used by the subsystem to, you know, to program the timer in a way that the system does not, you know, miss any schedule uh, event. So, in the other side, you can see, you know, the definition of the the, the power state in C, uh, and in, in this, this declaration, you know, you find description of which states. Uh, it's equivalent a description of the state and equivalence to ACPI when you are. Uh, you know, trying to do this map. Okay, so moving to the policy manager. The policy manager, as I have said, uh, it's one function that it's called from the idle thread with the number of ticks uh, to the next event, and it's responsible to return uh, a sleep state or a power state. The default policy, it's based on residence time. And the logic, uh, the logic is pretty simple. So it selects the deepest state available uh, uh, that the minimum, uh, so it selects the deepest state available that the minimum residence is lesser than the time to the next event. Uh, 
the policy also accounts for, uh, you know, for the state and latency constraints that can be imposed by applications or subsystems. Uh, applications can also you know, define their own policy. Uh, there is one symbol that they have to select, and then it's up to the application uh, to, to, to create your own policy, define this function. Uh, there is one function here that it's this PM state force that it's a way to bypass uh, the decision of the policy. So if the application decides you know, the, to, to force the system to go to a, to a specific state, can they use this API? And in this case, the, the system power management will not even ask the policy what it's going to be uh, the next state. Uh, the other you know, major area uh, in power management was efforts device power management. So first, uh, device power management is enabled uh, selecting the symbol PM device. And to support power management, drivers need to implement an a, a interface that it's a callback, an action callback that receives you know, an action that should be uh, taken. Um, this boils down to, to handle requests to suspend and resume the device. And you know, in some cases, if the device belongs to a power domain, then we also need to, you know, to handle uh, turn on and turn off. Uh, I have mentioned it, but uh, you know, on Zephyr we have these two methods uh, to do device power management. It's the static and dynamic. So instead, it, it's also called system management power management. It's the one that, you know, when the system goes idle, we suspend and resume, and when the system wakes up, we resume these devices. Dynamic or runtime power management, that it's the nomenclature that it's more used, uh, is the capability of, you know, uh, suspend or resume devices automatically according with, you know, their usage, and that does not depend on the, the system power management, does not depend on the system be idle to, to happen. Um, one note, you know, uh, regarding system management, uh, system managed power management, device power management, is that devices are suspended and resumed with their de uh, according with their dependencies. Uh, so it's pretty. We use the same dependencies that are used for in, uh, device initialization. So we suspend device according with their initialization, then we, uh, you know, revert this when uh, waking them. When. So. Uh, Coming back to the system power management diagram, uh, after the policy returns the state that should be used, if it's anything, then you know, active runtime, devices are sequentially suspended. Uh, the subsystem ignores some uh, devices that you know, depend on some conditions, like if the device is busy, or if the device is using runtime power management, or the device is used as a wake up source then uh, you know, uh, the, the system excludes this device from this list. Uh, then you know, after the SOC wakes, the devices are resumed in a reverse order that they were suspended. Uh, in a multi-core system, only you know, the, the last CPU, only when the last CPU is going to sleep is that the devices are suspended. And as soon as the first CPU wakes, devices are resumed. Okay, so uh, here's the part of Zephyr's code that you know, checks the conditions for a device to, to suspend. So as you can see, uh, if the device is not ready or it's busy or it's used as a wake up or it's using runtime, then a uh, device is not suspended. There is one option that you can even tune this, uh, that it's PM uh, need all device idle, that you know, if this option is enabled, if there is only, uh, at least one device that it's idle, then any device is suspended. So uh, now uh, let's see device runtime power management. Uh, that is the feature that you know, allows device to directly power management uh, uh, even when the CPU is active. Uh, it's enabled when you select the symbol device runtime. Uh, there is no additional API that needs to be implemented. Suspend and resume can be done as syn uh, synchronous and asynchronous. Uh, and you know, there are many advantages of doing this, right? Uh, the system uh, does not need to be idle to the device saving energy, so you can save more energy when you do this. Uh, this also speed up the, the, the system to, to the power management system 
because this system does not need to, to suspend devices that are already you know, using these and are already suspended, and the same applies to, to resume them. Uh, this method, it's a collaborative effort, so it really is, depends on you know, device drivers doing the subsistence and application. So yeah, it's very important to emphasize this uh, collaborative nature of, of these methods, since none of these you know, layers may have full knowledge of how to make the best decision about suspending and, and resuming a device. For example, uh, a device may naively always suspend itself when it finish, finishes a, an operation. This may be okay in some circumstances, but the main, uh, you know, there may be some cases you know, where multiple operations are, done in, in, are re, uh, realized in a sequence, and this approach may end up in, you know, just consuming more energy than safe. The same logic applies you know, for other layers, uh, like you know, uh, the subsystem may attempt to suspend the device without knowing if the application will need to use this. So the subsystem uses a reference count to check you know, when it needs to suspend or resume a device. And this way, each component can operate without worried about you know, each other. So that it's... Uh, as I have mentioned, uh, there are synchronous and asynchronous ways uh, to do the device runtime power management. Uh, let's start with the simplest case, that it's when you know, everything happens synchronously. Uh, in this example, we assume that the device is initially suspended, so as you can see, the idea is that when the application requests some operation from the device, the device then calls PM runtime get, that will increase the reference count for this device, and calls the action callback to resume the device. Then the device uh, do, the, you know, do the operation that it's called, and when it finish, the device will call the runtime put that will decrease the reference count, and finally, you know, call the action to suspend the device. Uh, the asynchronous case, it's pretty similar. The main difference is that, you know, when the device finishes the operation, instead of synchronously suspend the device, uh, it calls uh, a PM device from time, uh, put a sync, and the PM subsystem will, instead of, you know, call the action callback, at that moment, we will schedule the operation to the system work queue to be done later. Uh, we play, uh, some tricks here to avoid uh, unnecessary work. So if there is a request canceling an operation that it's in the queue, we just you know, do some adjustments in, in the reference and we avoid changing you know, uh, the, the state of the device. Uh, some additional notes here, device can enable and disable runtime power management uh, at runtime. Uh, and there is only a synchronous API of for to suspend devices. Uh, this is you know, a, a simplified version of how it works. Uh, in several cases, uh, the application would be calling a subsystem and the subsystem will be talking with the device for multiple calls. And in this case, the subsystem may be the one you know, holding the reference also to, to, to avoid these unnecessary transitions. Okay, so finally, uh, power domains. Uh, power domain is an abstraction to, to, to group a set of the devices that are you know, powered by a common source. On Zephyr support for power domains is enabled uh, with the PM device power domain option, and they are implemented just as regular devices. Uh, what basically makes a device a power domain is its relationship with other devices. Uh, this dependence uh, can be defined in device tree or can be done dynamically as well. Power domains are responsible to notify all the devices using uh, it when you know, it changes its state. So when the domain is suspended, it goes through all children devices and ask them to turn off, uh, call the, the action callback with the turn off action. And when the domain is uh, resumed, you know, uh, it goes through all the, the, the children and uh, with the action turn on. Uh, if you are using device runtime power management, the subsystem will automatically suspend and resume the domain as well if you need it. So the domain, uh, if the children uh, need, uh, 
uh, the, the application or someone needs to, to, to use the a device, the device is using the runtime power management, this will automatically wake up or resume or, or and suspend the domain if there is no other, uh, no one else using the domain. So the next few slides, uh, uh, the idea is to wrap up uh, what is necessary to enable and implement power management uh, in SOCs and also in, in drivers. Uh, so first things first, right? Uh, these are the three key config options that enable and disable power management features on Zephyr, basically. The first option, config PM, enables the system power management, uh, the, the, the power management for SOC. And when this is enabled, the idle thread will call you know, the, the SOC APIs that was mentioned before. Uh, the next option is to enable device power management, which will make the, device, uh, you know, make the system suspend and resume device when the CPU is idle. Finally, uh, there is this option to enable uh, device runtime power management. Uh, the reason that we split you know, device runtime power management from the, the regular system managed power management is to save some resources. So if you're not using device runtime power management, there are a lot of uh, data that, it's, uh, that doesn't need to be used. So we save some resources when doing it. And it's important to mention these options can all be combined. So you can use even the two methods to do device runtime, uh, device power management. Uh, so when implementing power management for SOC, you have to implement these two functions, uh, PM state set and the exit post operations. And if you are using the default policy manager, you have to declare you know, the states in the device tree. So let me just make a, a point here. Declare power states in the device tree, it's not mandatory to, to execute the software. If you are implementing a custom policy, you know, and you ensure that the states return by your policy are known by the SOC, then you, know, you basically can return whatever you want. But you know, it, it's really recommended to have the supported states declared in the device tree because it, it, this information it would be you know, widely available for all the, the, the rest of the system. Uh, another thing is to remember is that interruptions need to be restored after the uh, exit operation, post operations. Um, this is an example of how to define power state. First, you declare which power states are supported by the target with the you know, appropriated information. And finally, you have to set per CPU which power state should be used. In multi-core systems, you can have different set of uh, states per CPU. Uh, following up, uh, if you want to implement your own policy manager, there are two things that you know, have to be done. First, uh, disable the default policy. And second, implement the, the, this uh, function, the PM policy next state. The policy is where uh, you know, uh, the power state constraints and latency are accounted. So you have to account these constraints that are imposed by other parts of the system and application. So if you're writing policy and want to use a state constraint and latency constraints, you have to check this in your own policy. Uh, on my left, uh, the, you see the, the, the full policy implementation. And uh, if you can note, say, it iterates you know, in a reverse order, assuming that you know, that is another thing that is important to mention. All the power states should be declared uh, in the correct order. So from the uh, shallow state, the deepest state, uh, sleep state. And then uh, checks you know, if, the, uh, if there is any lock for a specific state, if there is no lock, uh, checks the latency, uh, the, the exit latency for the state. If it's lower than the max latency, then finally, you know, we, we just check the, the number of ticks for the next event, and we, we return this state. Okay, so to implement power management on device, the very first thing to do is to implement the action callback. Uh, this callback can be called to suspend or resume the device when the system is idle or uh, doing device runtime power management. If the device is part of a power domain, it will also be called with, uh, when the domain is suspended or resumed. Then uh, the next step is, uh, is to define the power management infrastructure uh, for the device using PM device define or you know, the device tree version, the PM device DT define for the, the, when you are using uh, device tree. 
to, to declare the device. The last step is to pass you know, the, the, the previously created in, uh, power management infrastructure to the device when defining the, the device. As you can see, uh, there are macros to do this. Uh, if the device belongs to a power domain, it can be described in the device tree using a proper uh, power domain, or it can be later you know, added to the domain using a, a, a runtime API, the PM device power domain add. Uh, for device runtime power management, there is no new, uh, new API that needs to be implemented. Uh, what must be done is to make the device as much power aware, uh, sorry, as much uh, as much power as possible, aware, suspend and resume devices itself when needed. Uh, strategies about how you know, to use this infrastructure really depends on the, dri on the driver and the subsystem or even in the application. Uh, the last piece you know, that uh, I will cover uh, implementation is power domains. Uh, they are, as I was mentioned, just devices. There is no specific API for a power domain. That said, they are a special, a special kind of devices uh, when you are you know, implementing power management. The very first thing is, the, is that they have to declare as compatible with power domain in the device tree or when you are you know, manually de defining the device. The other thing that power domains uh, need to do is to notify all the devices that are under, you know, that are under uh, them. Uh, there is a functional helper to do this, so you iterate over the you know, children devices and you call the action callback for these children. And uh, you know, uh, there are much more about power management, uh, other areas like uh, if you're looking for device power management, you can set the device busy uh, and, and change it, the, how it behaves uh, for system power management or runtime power management. Uh, you can you know, tune what is the initial state of a, a device. Uh, device power management also you have to worry about, you know, uh, you, or, you, you, you can you know, look for wake-up sources, uh, define a, a, a device, uh, device as a wake-up source. You, can, you have APIs to you know, turn in the, the, the policy. You can add or remove uh, latency requirements. And there are events that you can set. So there are many other areas, but I, that is basically the general idea of you know, the capabilities of the, the, the subsystem. Uh, and I think we are open for questions. Yeah. Test suite. Um, so with device power management, um, there doesn't seem to be a huge amount of uh, drivers actually implementing that, um, at least in the upstream tree. Do you have any ideas of how that can sort of that situation can be sort of improved, or people can be um, incentivized, I guess, to implement that when submitting drivers? Yeah. So uh, the initial method for uh, when you know power management was implemented on Zephyr, we had only the system management uh, method, and that was you know, and that it's the easiest one. That it's basically implement a callback. So most of the devices support this, but they don't support real, uh, the runtime device power management that requires more uh, effort. There are some devices that are, you know, doing this already, so I, you know, uh, I believe in that as soon as we have more use cases, more the other devices will start following this. First of all, great, great presentation, Flavio. Um, quick question for you. So, you know, uh, power management, uh, you know, the APIs are, are wonderful. Um, what I, you know, the thing that uh, I think some, some newer parts and maybe even some of our own parts, you know, clock scaling uh, and, and trying to save power uh, through clock scaling, is that something that uh, you've considered in the system power management? Um, APIs and such. Yeah, you 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 are talking about changing the the, the clock frequency and uh, yeah, there is uh, there are some plans to, to, to support this. 
obviously there is the complexity because then you have basically to go and notify you know everyone that you know the, uh, uh, the clock has changed so the device has to accommodate these and but there are plans to do that are you considering um, adding that to the existing like power management APIs or is this going to be or is there some thought that this would be a separate clock tree um, configuration kind of thing? So I, I believe would you know I I don't want to overload the, the API the, the the current you know power management API uh, the, at least the callback to not become to not become you know some IO control API like you have only one API with you know that does a lot of things so probably this would be uh, additional. Uh, so this is a question actually for both probably Tom and Flavio. Um, so Tom, I know, I think you put in some uh, device power management into some sensors. Um, and so I'm curious how that plays with the runtime power management. Yeah, that it's a, that it's a good question. And we've been talking about these. Hangsters are definitely the most complex uh, use case that we have right now, especially because you know they, they vary a lot and they have a lot of data and they, there is calibration that, that they can lose if you suspend the, 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 the sensor. So we are still grasping in this area, Duncan, as maintainer of the area. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I'm a co-maintainer there, but um, yeah, there's definitely we've we've definitely talked quite a bit about this. Uh, we had a, a great, you know, in the sensor working group that we have going in the project, uh, we had one of those meetings was dedicated to exactly this topic. Um, the, the current API really is is stateful, uh, so you you know you can set random attributes of a sensor. I'm going to set my sample rate. I'm going to set my range of readings. Um, a lot of these sensors do take some time to start as well, so you don't necessarily want to be, you know, constantly turning them off and on uh, when it takes, you know, 100 milliseconds to turn the thing back on and get back to where you were. Um, so there's a lot to consider there, and um, but you know, the kind of the kind of the consensus or close to consensus that I think we came to was that, you know, in, in order to enable power power management with sensors, they do need to sort of probably maintain the state that they they had before turning them off and then restore that state when turning them back on. Um, of course, the downside of that is now, you know, all those attributes that, you know, were stored off on the, the sensor now need to be kept in, in uh, your application's memory in, in Zephyr, which has a cost. Um, but yeah, other than that, I mean, the, the, there's, a, there's a newer API that might um, also help us here because the, uh, the current sensor API, we have this sort of ad hoc read, right? At any time, after setting a bunch of attributes, you can just go, hey, go read my sensor. Uh, that's not really amenable to um, power management, right? So if, I, if I'm constantly, I set all my attributes, and then, I don't know, in a timer, I go read my sensor once a millisecond, and then turn it off, turn it back on, turn it off, turn it back on. Um, that's not really a great, great story in terms of um, yeah, you know, managing time and resources and things. So. Uh, yeah, I, I definitely don't see you know the sensors doing runtime power management in, in itself. De definitely, they will have to collaborate with the subsystem, especially because there are several sensors that do this uh, you know sequential calls for for the sensor, and that makes, doesn't make any sense, right? For the sensor, you know, to suspend and resume between these calls, uh, knowing that they are sequential. jump in as long as nobody else needs to. Um, anyway, hi, Flavia, how you doing? Um, so it, this is sort of a, 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 a little bit of a digression, but you know, obviously in the context of the, the uh, Meteor Lake DSP, there was uh, uh, something of a digression from the Zephyr Power Management Framework, um, where instead of you know, suspending nicely from the idle thread, they had a pre-existing architecture which would do it under affirmative control, basically by a, a you know, cross CPU IPC out of the, the, the mm -hmm. host kernel and just saying suspend now. And of course, that's exactly what it did. It, it, it entered a, a routine that did a ad hoc kind of, you know, DIY context switch. And, 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 I, and I'm on the record as not being real thrilled with that. I don't, is there any, is it, is it worth discussing anything that might be useful to the existing framework to try to 
maybe prevent that in the future or, or guide systems well, to a cleaner uh, <laughs> API? Yeah. As far as I know, they are not doing this anymore. They are doing it inside the IDO thread when they are suspended. Right. So yeah, they have exactly. a way to force the next state and basically bypass. But they, and, and, and they play a lot of tricks, right? So that is one of the parts that I was talking about doing. So they basically disable some states for different cores and they let one, one core you know, be active at the time. So the, uh, the framework is there and they, they are using. Uh, and it's. I mean, as far as I know, it's working. Right, yeah, yeah you, can't, you can't make people do so. stuff. Um, it, was, it was just a, a little bit of, I think, a learning curve for them, and I was wondering if there was uh, uh, anything to report or <laughs> Yeah, so, uh, so when they started using this, uh, it was, you know, there were a lot of hacks that they did in the industrial layer to check if the other CPUs were, you know, weak, and that was completely a mess. So they moved this upper layer so that, they, you know, the the application now it's responsible to you know to to, to ensure that the policy will just select the, the pro, uh, most appropriate state for the for the CPU. So they put some constraint. They are starting using to constraints for for specific states and CPUs. It's time. Yeah. So thank you everyone. <laughs>